All right. Hello and good morning. Uh, welcome to the session about GDPR. My name is David Walsh. I work for Aperio here in Europe, um, and I lead the technical team for the CRM practice. And I'm a certified Salesforce technical architect, which I'm obviously very proud of. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how I got through that, um, but uh, it's probably the biggest achievement I have. Next to speaking about GDPR at an event like this. So first of all, to say, look, this isn't a, a legal session. Obviously, the, the GDPR is a, is a regulation, it's a law. So um, do not take this advice as legal advice. This is opinion. This is suggestions. Um, and where I think I do have a good understanding of GDPR, I'm certainly not paid enough to be giving legal advice about it. So we're going to focus on the core platform as well, rather than sort of talking about lots of the other clouds, just sort of to give our, ourselves uh, time to get through some stuff. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the functionality will be driven anyway from the core platform. So it's, um, yeah. It's mostly core platform focused. So let's talk it for a moment about Brexit since we're in the UK. Um, a couple of things to say about this. One is that it's anticipated that the uh, UK will also enact something very similar to GDPR. The UK was a big contributor to drafting uh, the GDPR, so no reason to think that they will deviate too far from it. But it's also important to note that even if um, the UK decided to have a completely different regulation, for any business that is still trading or still selling goods or services into the EU, they still need to be GDPR compliant. Um, so let's take an example of that. Um, let's take the example of a US company. No feet on the ground, no buildings, um, no shops in EU, but they do have websites that they sell via. Let's say .co.uk, they sell in GBP. Well, any transactions that they uh, perform and that they gather um, EU citizen data via, they will have to be GDPR compliant when they're processing that data. So the GDPR, while it is an EU regulation, does have an implication uh, outside the EU for anyone who wants to do business um, uh, in the EU and for anyone also who monitors EU citizen data. So for Brexit, um, if someone is doing business with the EU, it's, uh, it's still very applicable. So just as a, a sort of an overview, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of assuming people have some understanding of what GDPR is, but just to set the scene. And the GDP, GDPR defines the rights of the individual, the principles and obligations that a company must operate under, and the sanctions then that can be used to enforce the GDPR. So we're going to talk today about um, the specifics around the rights and principles and what that might mean for a Salesforce implementation. So I won't go into any detail uh, on any of them here at the moment. Um, but let's remind ourselves that May 25th, that's the date that the GDPR becomes enforceable. So the GDPR is already drafted, it's already in place, it's a, it's a regulation that exists. Um, but uh, there was a grace period, it was about two years, between sort of finalization of the GDPR and enforcement. And that's to allow companies to change to be GDPR compliant. So May 25th, in theory, if you're not GDPR compliant, you're breaking the law and could be fined. The fines are pretty, uh, can be pretty steep. So it's up to 4% of annual turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is greater. Now that's the top end. And so I can imagine that maybe not every company will get that particular fine. But uh, you know, if you are seriously in breach and you're a large corporation, I would expect that they will probably make an example of um, a few companies at the beginning just to sort of get people really thinking about GDPR. One thing to say is that it's, it's um, being completely GDPR compliant on May 25th may be a little tricky because like any regulation until it actually starts going through the courts and starts being enforced, it's maybe a little difficult to know where the line is. And there's little gray areas uh, within the GDPR. So again, coming back to that thing of getting a bit of legal advice, someone who maybe has experience, has been talking um, to people at a, a, um, on the legal side of things is, is probably worthwhile uh, once you've done your initial research because maybe there's certain areas that you feel are gray for your particular company. So uh, let's keep going. So first of all, let's just talk about what personal data is because that's probably the most important thing. The GDPR doesn't apply to all data, it applies to personal data. So there's two types of personal data that's defined under the GDPR. 
general personal data like your age, your address. Um, but your age alone is not personal data. If all you have on someone is their age, you can't identify them as an individual. So that wouldn't be considered personal data, strangely enough. But if you've got someone's date of birth, their address, and their name, then all of a sudden, you'd be able to, you're able to identify an individual. So that's then personal data, and that would come under GDPR. Um, there's also the concept of sensitive personal data. So this is race, ethnic origin, genetic, uh, sexual orientation, any of that sort of information is considered sensitive. And that would be something where GDPR has stricter uh, rules and guidelines around. Um, and I would suggest that if that's something that your company or your clients are, are, are processing a lot, definitely the legal advice is, is worth getting there because that's, um, that's a, whole, a whole different ball game, I guess. Um, and then finally, let's just talk a little bit about pseudonymous and anonymous data. So there are two important concepts as well. So pseudonymous is where you've encrypted data with a key. So it's still um, under the GDPR regulation because you can still decrypt it and see the personal, personally identifiable information. Um, but obviously, because you've encrypted it, you've already taken one step towards data security. Uh, GDPR does not uh, mandate encryption at rest. But it is something you may want to consider. Uh, anonymous data is not um, under, uh, held under the GDPR. So if you all of a sudden go from having uh, personal data on someone that you can identify an individual, but you decide to anonymize that data so that you can never get back to the original point, that's called anonymous. And all of a sudden, you're not, um, you're not, uh, you don't need to comply with the GDPR for that data. So we'll come back to that point because that's an important one. You don't necessarily need to delete data, but you can anonymize it. So you can still sort of draw statistics from it, but maybe not identify individuals from that data. And we'll see how we can apply that um, a little bit later on. Final thing to say is that, look, this doesn't come out of the blue. There was an EU directive. A directive is just a set of guidelines. All the countries implemented that their own way. It became a bit of a mess. It was difficult to navigate. And the GDPR is basically the EU saying, look, let's clear away all that. And let's try and set the scene, set a very sort of easy baseline for companies to understand. So a lot of companies will be compliant with the GDPR already um, in certain areas, but the GDPR takes it certainly a few steps beyond what the EU directives were, excuse me, were. So um, yeah, definitely, you know, it's, it's not starting from scratch, but it's definitely probably taking a few steps that haven't been thought about before. So where should the focus be? The technology as in everything, anytime we implement Salesforce, we don't implement technology. You implement something that's going to work for the people and the processes that you want to implement it for. GDPR is no different. The main thing that you need to do is to, A, train people. So think about the example of a marketing executive or a marketing administrator who decides, you know what, I'm going to take a copy of all my personal data from Salesforce, put it into a spreadsheet, do my own thing with it, send it around to people. All of a sudden, you've got a big problem there because you've got all this personal data that's insecure, that's being sent around, and you don't know about it. So if your data, local data protection authority comes knocking, then you can't tell them where all your personal data is. You don't know that anymore. So making sure that the people that are using the systems understand GDPR is really, really key. And then processes. So we're going to see that a lot of the rights, when someone comes and says, I want to, um, to act on my right to whatever under the GDPR, well, as a company, you need to be able to service that right. And then if you multiply that by whatever many customers should decide to exercise that right in any given month, you've got a big problem unless you've got some very strong processes in place. So the main thing really to say is people and processes. That's, that's the technology is just an enabler, and we'll talk about the technology, but it, it, we'll keep coming back to this theme of people and processes. So, uh, to set the scene for what Salesforce needs to sort of start, or what you need to start thinking about with regards to Salesforce, there's two principles. So these are things that the companies, companies must do under GDPR. So accountability. Um, you must be able to demonstrate that you're compliant with the GDPR. So that's different to the e-directive. So when the Data Protection Authority comes along, you, they will just say, show me how you're complying with the GDPR, most likely. So you have to be able to sort of give them an overview of what you've done, what your processes are, what you've got in place. So it's, it's much more you have to prove rather than in the EU directive, it was a little bit more about 
okay, well, if something happens, then maybe I have to sort of state my case. So it's much more, um, I guess, much more onus on the uh, controllers of the data, as the GDPR calls them, the companies who, who, uh, who own the data. Data protection by design and default, so your systems can't just be sort of bolted on the side, this GDPR um, stuff. It has to be sort of built in from the very beginning. So what, how exactly you would, <laughs> the data protection authority would decide to test that is, is one of those areas that maybe we don't know yet, but uh, definitely when we think about Salesforce, we can understand that, look, we need to design Salesforce in a way that, that is GDPR compliant. So Salesforce then, I mean, it, by its very nature, um, it does help with GDPR compliance. Um, it is a customer-centric system. So what I mean by that is we've got core objects uh, within Salesforce, like the contact, like lead, like person accounts, that, hold, that will generally hold your, the personal information you have on someone. So immediately, you know where your personal data is in Salesforce in general. And a lot of the core functionality and the extended functionality comes from those core objects. So customer-centric is going to help out of the box. The um, legacy systems that people have are maybe not so GDPR compliant. There may be a lack of transparency, a, lot of, a lack of um, control within that particular system. Um, and it's very often what I've seen is organizations are going to struggle to understand even where that personal data is stored, how it's stored, what people are doing with it. So you know, immediately um, you start to get into to difficulty there. And Salesforce actually see this as a big opportunity um, because it's, it's a way to go into clients and say you need to consolidate your systems. You need to sort of come, bring it all into one platform, make it easy, build your processes straight into the system and go from there. So Salesforce, um, yeah, they, they see themselves as a way to, um, to actually meet GDPR. Now, what Salesforce are doing is they have uh, security and compliance for themselves. Um, so they, I mean, as all of you are probably aware, they have done a lot of work around this. They've put a lot of effort into uh, being GDPR compliant, and Salesforce will always uh, see that as a core part of their business. So they've done a lot of work internally, um, but also training and guidance, so internally and externally. As a partner, uh, I've been to partner enablement sessions. As customers, we all have access to trailheads and, and um, a lot of the sort of talks and the, uh, the training material that they've provided, and that will continue to increase over time. Um, and then product innovation, so Spring 18 brings some innovations, and we'll, we'll talk about them in a minute. But uh, finally, they're also, I mean, they're, they're continuing to collaborate with customers and authorities. And one of the themes that when you talk to Salesforce is that they don't have everything built into the system today, but they will continue to adapt the system to be GDPR compliant. As they understand what a majority of customers are asking for, how the law is being applied and stuff like that. So they will continue to iterate uh, as, as always. So what you should probably start with is an audit of Salesforce, right? If you have an existing Salesforce system, uh, you need to look at uh, who has access to your system, who has access to your records, who has access uh, via uh, profiles and field level security. Um, this idea of protection by default and design, you just need to make sure that your Salesforce org actually meets that obligation. Um, Salesforce Shield is something that um, a lot of customers are thinking might help with this. So if you think about the capability of Shield, encryption at rest, not mandated by GDPR, but um, it, can be, uh, it can be something that can help, uh, particularly with that sensitive information, for example, if you don't want everyone to be seeing uh, particular parts of your data. Uh, monitoring, so understanding what events are going on in the system, who's downloading large amounts of personal data, so Shield can help with that, and you can either stop that or just monitor it as time goes on. So if you think about data breach and stuff like that, Salesforce Shield is going to help there. Um, Two other principles that you'd want to roll in the, into that order is the idea of data minimization and purpose minimization. <coughs> so data minimization being the idea that your, um, the amount of data that you collect on someone, it has to be tied with the purpose for what you're collecting it. So if you're just executing a contract with someone, maybe you don't need to capture a whole bunch of details about their extended family or about their um, previous lives. Well, GDPR mandates that, right? You can only collect the data you need to execute that contract or to execute whatever bit of processing that you're doing. So when you're looking at Salesforce, you need to be looking at, well, what personal data am I actually collecting and do I need it? What is the need for this personal data? And the second is purpose limitation. So um, purpose limitation is an interesting one because to process personal data, you need a lawful basis to do so. And lawful basis is a really important concept under GDPR. 
So a lawful basis might be consent. You know, this idea when you tick a, a form to receive marketing. Well, you're giving consent there. That's a lawful brace, basis for processing personal information for that company. But other lawful basis might be contract execution, maybe legal obligations. So if you're in a healthcare or a finance industry, you need to hold on to data for a period of time um, to, to comply with other legal regulations. Um, but the point is, whatever you collect the data for and whatever the person has given you permission for, that's the only thing you can use that data for. You can't collect data and then use it for a whole bunch of other purposes without explicitly telling the person and for that person to have given you consent to do that. So during any Salesforce audit, you've got to make sure that those two principles, those two obligations, are something that's built into your Salesforce. That you're not allowed peeping just to, people just to grab a bunch of data and do something that has ne hasn't been discussed with the customer before. With that data. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit then about Spring 18. Uh, mostly deployed uh, over the weekend, far as I know. Um, the big thing in that is the individual object. Um, it's a new standard object that Salesforce have brought out. Um, I mean, I would say this is a step in the right direction. I, I wouldn't say that it's going to give you everything you need. But it is a, an object that can be linked to lots of the existing records you're going to have in Salesforce. So your contact, your lead, etc. Uh, it's not a fully fledged object. And what I mean by that is it doesn't support all the functions, functions, and, feature, uh, functions and features that um, a full Salesforce standard object might support. So for example, record types um, are not supported yet with this object. But I, I would imagine that is coming. It's just to sort of get this out the door uh, ahead of uh, GDPR. It holds a lot of information that you want to hold. And um, so that's sort of these flags that are listed here, the do not process, don't profile, don't solicit, etc. right? They're all things that will help you become GDPR compliant. So, um, yeah, this just needs to be enabled in your org. I mean, it's, it's a standard object, right? It's not something you need to buy. As far as I know, it's not counted towards your storage limits in Salesforce, so turning it on and then populating it isn't going to kill your, kill your org. Um, and then, um, yeah, I would say that, that there's limitations with it, but it's a step in the right direction. So definitely, you know, if you think about how Salesforce works, using this object is prefer preferred because they're going to build a whole bunch of functionality around it ultimately, right? So ignore at your peril, as always, with Salesforce functionality. So, uh, Talking about individuals, so let's talk about consent uh, for just a, a second. So we know that's a lawful basis for processing data. Um, but a couple of things to say about consent. It must be given with a clear affirmative action. So the whole pre-ticked checkbox on a form, that's actually not compliant with GDPR. So to collect and use someone's data for marketing purposes where you've no other lawful basis, so they've no contract, they've got no legal obligation with you, to collect and market to that person, they have to have said, yes, I understand your terms and conditions, I understand your data protection statement, and I am giving you consent to market to me on these particular topics. So if you think about a large company with lots of different brands, for example, or different business units, different regions, that isn't a, you can't have a consent that says, give me everything that you, you want to send. That person may be ticking the box for this brand or this particular product I'm willing to receive information on. And think about the purpose limitation. You can't just go use that everywhere else, right? So consent is very specific. And informed is an important word. Whatever you give that person has to be in plain, um, understandable English. Can't be in legalese. Can't be something that someone doesn't understand. It has to be understandable by a, a lay person, let's say, a, a non-legal professional. Um, and you must be able to demonstrate that you have actually captured valid consent. That's a really important one, right? So the individual object is helpful, but the reason I say it's maybe limited is you have to be able to say to someone, this is when I captured your, your consent for this particular um, uh, part of my business to do these X, Y, and Z against this particular protection <laughs> statement. So you can immediately imagine that, well, maybe that's not something that a single field is going to cover. Maybe I need to have a little bit more of a nuanced um, sort of build around consent. So if we talk about um, maybe what you could do in Salesforce, so we know, look, against the standard contact and lead, you have the, all the normal sort of do not call, email update. And a lot of the functionality around Salesforce takes, takes uh, that into consideration, right? So Marketing Cloud Connect, for example, takes in the email update into consideration when you're, when you're drawing that stuff in. The individual object goes a step further. But really, I think the custom object for a richer functionality, so building out that look, I'm capturing your consent for this part of my business, for these purposes, against this statement. 
that's, I mean, so you're, you're all of a sudden compliant with GDPR by doing that, right? So building um, some functionality with custom objects, I would say is probably a good thing, something to think about anyway. Um, service Cloud then, uh, it basically has, you know, if you think about, say, people getting emails and they no longer want, Service Cloud has uh, the ability for people to control. Chatter notifications, Marketing Cloud, you've got your opt-out opt options. And then community cloud is going to be pretty important because then you can all of a sudden surface those consent mechanisms to the person. So uh, customers can leave groups that they no longer want um, to be a part of. And in the future, um, and you know the usual caveats apply here, but in the future, Salesforce are talking about um, admins receiving uh, notifications around consents and then logging policy updates via chatter. So your policy changes, you need to let people know. You need to let people know that they, um, they are, th that things have changed, that maybe need, they need to opt in again. So that's consent. Let's talk about some of the rights then. So the rights are of the individual, but they, they have the ability to exercise these rights with your company or with your clients. So um, you can basically request a company to remove all the data that they have about you. Now, this is not an absolute right, so we go back to that thing of legal basis. So if you've got contractual need to hold information, someone can't come along and say, right, just get rid of all my personal data, and all of a sudden, that contract, you, can't, you can no longer execute it because you don't know anything about that person. The contractual um, uh, part would supersede this right, or a legal obligation to hold, it, hold that data. So it's about the person being able to say, okay, the lawful basis has now gone for you holding my data. I'm withdrawing consent, for example, and there's no other lawful basis um, uh, that allows you to hold this data, so now I want you to get rid of it. So um, think about the anonymous versus delete here just for a second. So this is what we talked a little bit about at the beginning. Okay, deleting the data is one way to, to, do, to do this, but maybe you want to store some of that data just so that you can, in the future, as a company, you can understand where you've come from. So making it anonymous means that all of a sudden it's not no longer um, subject to GDPR. So you've, ex you've given the person their right to erasure. You no longer can identify them as an individual. And that data is, is, uh, is still in your system, but it's no longer covered by GDPR. But if we think about what Salesforce, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a relatively easy one for most objects, right? Most objects can just be deleted, right? If you do need to delete, you can just delete them. Um, Spring 18 brings some functionality around the field audit trail, so you can, so you can delete out of that. That's obviously somewhere you might have, have uh, changes captured. And then big objects, if that's something that you are using, again, they've, they've turned on this delete functionality in big objects. But Salesforce has this thing called a user object, which cannot be deleted. Um, but then you've got to think about, okay, well, I need to make this anonymous. I, don't, I can't delete the record, but then I can make it anonymous, and I can nullify fields. So a lot of the fields are not required you can make them all null. The fields that are required, you can make them anonymous by putting in, like if you think email address, you can put in some fake email address. Now for external users, they don't have to sort of uh, confirm that change of email address. For internal users, you would get that notification. And remember, GDPR applies to your own users as well as maybe customers. So um, rather than having to go through that sort of email verification, you can raise a ticket with Salesforce, get them to turn that off for a, a temporary period, change your email addresses, and then turn it back on. Now, because that's only for internal users, that might seem like a lot of hassle, but hopefully you're not getting like hundreds of these every day, right? Maybe you can just sort of uh, take them all into account at the same time and just have an hour period where you're sort of changing the emails and making them, them null and void. The, um, there's also a couple of things uh, just to remember. The, when you, if you have social sign-on enabled, there will be records um, associated with that that will hold some personal information, so you need to remember to delete them. Uh, and then access to the user detail page. So, I mean, it's, it's maybe not the best thing to have everyone in your organization able to see everyone else's user detail page. So if that is something that you have allowed, maybe you want to think about turning that off. And uh, there is that sort of um, restrict, uh, restrict viewing user detail uh, option that you can go with there. So that's... Um, users, if we think about some of the other clouds, I mean, d delete, you know, there's a lot in Salesforce that you could have to delete. So if you think sales cloud, you could have voicemails stored there. Uh, you can delete them based on phone numbers. Your uh, emails that maybe you've got uh, in your system through various parts, well, you, you, you can delete them based on the email address. And then if you've got Einstein turned on, 
uh, Salesforce will sort of allow you to log a ticket and then they can uh, start deleting data on their side, uh, anything that they have on that. So important that you understand, this is, this is why that audit is important, right? That understanding exactly where the data is um, and what you're doing with it. It may not be something you're necessarily processing, but, but understanding everywhere where it might live and then having a process in place to actually go and delete that when someone executes this right is really important. So community of cloud, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things you can delete via your sort of REST API, sort of user activity, your chatter posts, all those feed elements and stuff like that. Uh, and then finally, back to that point of, well, maybe you know, this person has been a really active community member and you don't want to lose all those you know, great questions or, or posts that they've made. Well, you can basically turn, uh, again, turn that on an anonymous user, right? So change their profile so it no longer links to any of their personal information and drops out of uh, having to be GDPR compliant because that's no longer personal data. So right to erasure, uh, very important. Talk a little bit about process. I mean, I won't bore you to death with this, but what you might think about doing is uh, putting in place a process something like this. So someone rings up or someone goes onto your community, says, I want to be forgotten. Uh, first thing you have to do is make sure that person is who they say they are, right? I mean, this would be something... I can imagine GDPR is going to be tested by various uh, people with ulterior motives, ringing up companies with lots of spurious um, rights requests. So obviously having a, good, a, a fairly efficient process to understand who the person is, is probably something you're doing anyway. Um, but also then, it's not just the case of going and deleting it. The first question you have to ask yourself is, um, do, I, do I have a, a lawful basis for holding this information? Do I have to actually execute this request? There's no point in deleting data if you, if you find out later on, oh, well, actually, I needed that data. So important to say that, um, you know, check your lawful basis and have a process in place for doing that. And then it's the usual, you know, you can obviously automate some of this stuff. Maybe you want to keep some of it manual. Um, you know, the user record, the, the other records that you may want to make anonymous or, or, um, or delete. But, you know, process, 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 process. It's really important. So let's talk about another right, the right of data portability. So this is the, the sort of concept that if I want to change uh, away from your business and maybe move to another, um, well, that should be easy for me as a customer, right? The EU wants to make that easy. And that's, that's the sort of the basis of this particular right. So I can ask a company, give me all my data, whether it be in CSV, whether it be uh, in, in some commonly defined format, CSV probably the most likely from Salesforce. But I want to be able to take a copy of that data and do whatever I want with it. So as a business, we have to be able to support that. Um, Salesforce has a lot of this stuff out of the box, right? Um, as you can imagine, you know, reports, your APIs, your data loader, um, Apex potentially. You know, you can pull a lot of data out of Salesforce, everything via the API. So you can imagine building a process around some of that standard functionality. Maybe it's as easy as running a few reports, but you'll have to have identify those reports and where exactly you're getting the data. Sales Cloud has Sales Cloud Inbox. So if you think about that's data that has um, come from that source system, uh, you can still extract that um, via the normal channels. Einstein, again, we're back to logging a ticket with Salesforce. And then Marketing Cloud has its own features and functionality. And Marketing Cloud, uh, I did see a talk by some of the product owners of Marketing Cloud, and they have said that, look, we've got some of the standard functionality out of the box, but we will continue to build as time goes on as we start to get requests from customers. So they feel a lot of uh, GDPR is achievable out of the box, but they'll probably try and make it easier over time. So let's talk about uh, restriction of processing. It's another right. So this is the idea that the person can't ask you to delete, but maybe there's a dispute over their data, so they want you to restrict what you're doing with it. So rather than still being able to market to them potentially, you can still, so you might be able to execute a contract, but they no longer want to receive emails for you, from you for a period of time. Um, this one is you've got the individual object, the do not process flag, so you could start to put in place stuff around that. Again, you would need to make sure everyone's aware of that particular flag. Um, you probably don't want to log them as a, you know, as a great community user, put them in as top user or a community, community knowledgeable user. Um, Marketing Cloud can take, it, can take some of this into consideration via the API. Um, but also, uh, and I've heard this, this said that like there's this idea that well maybe when someone is trying to execute this right they're not actually trying to they, they want some other outcome and they just think this is the easiest way to get it so for example I don't want you to send me any information about this particular product but actually I really like this other product that you sell and I still want my information there 
Well, restriction of processing would be a, uh, a complete turnoff. So maybe you want to train people to, to, to talk to the person and say, look, what's the outcome you're actually trying to meet here? What's your, what's your grievance, let's say? And what, can I help you in another way? Can we do something that's, uh, that still allows me to use your data? But you know, give you what you want as well. So back to the, uh, the people and processes there. Uh, I won't talk, it's a, it's, it'll be a similar enough process. Um, I'll, uh, well, so I'm not gonna say much about this. There's an ultra conservative approach to this where you would actually extract data from Salesforce and put it into another system and then let, um, until that dispute or that, that can be uh, changed again. Seems a little bit over the top to me, I gotta be honest. Um, but if you had a very large, complex organization with a lot of people seeing a lot of data, maybe that's something, maybe that's the only way you feel comfortable that people aren't going to be uh, processing that personal data. Um, the right to access. So this is another uh, right, obviously. So data has subjects, and this is an important one, right? Because this is where you know, doing that audit, having your processes in place becomes really important. They have the right to obtain lots of different things, right? What are you doing with my data? What data do you have? Where did you get it? When did you get it? Who else are you sharing it with? Like, do you have partners that you're actually giving this data to? So you've got to be able to tell that person. You've got to be able to give them something that says, that's what we're doing with your, with your particular data. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not something that you're going to build into Salesforce, but it is something you need to understand what Salesforce is doing with it. Um, also, as part of that right, they can request a copy of that data. So, you know, we're back to that data portability um, piece. The, yeah, and the source of the data, I guess we talked about that as well, you know, having that sort of mechanism where you're actually capturing more detail than just a flag of consent or whatever, you're capturing more detail than that. Um, so you can meet, meet this particular right when someone wants to exercise it. And finally, um, uh, for this talk, uh, we talk about the right to rectification. And this is, this is one of the easy ones with Salesforce, right? Because it's a system that makes it quite easy if you've, got, if you've architected Salesforce in a way uh, that uses the standard objects, which hopefully most people do. It becomes quite easy, right, to rectify information in Salesforce. You just change it in the contact record or wherever. Now, we need to be a little bit careful with this because often with Salesforce, um, we will have built um, structures to get around some limitations. So if you think about reporting in Salesforce and that sort of three or four object limit uh, in reporting, well, maybe you've taken some data from contact and you've denormalized it into other parts of your database so that you can get around that restriction. Well, hey, presto, there's personal information. So if you have to rectify that inter information, you need to start thinking about, okay, well, where are all the places that I start to need to rectify that? Also, it's, uh, if you think about the wider um, business or the wider company, Salesforce is generally not going to be the only system. But, uh, and if you think about someone coming along, they're not just asking you to do this in Salesforce, they're asking you to, to rectify the information in all the systems that you have. So again, you know, you come back to some solid architecture decisions around, well, do I have a source of truth for this data? Does that sort of, um, if I change it here, does it sort of get fed into those other systems? Uh, and again, back to that consolidation idea that Salesforce is quite excited about that. Look, if you all of a sudden, every time someone asks this, you have to go and change 15 or 20 systems and it's going to take you a long time to do that. Well, that's quite onerous then. So maybe consolidating down into Salesforce or having that kind of source of truth idea that's fed from Salesforce, I think that becomes a really important point. So looking at your, your audit of Salesforce, looking at your architecture decisions, maybe rolling back some architecture decisions as needed just to make some of this easier to meet, uh, maybe something you want to do. So that is all I'm going to say. Uh, thank you for bearing with me on that. But uh, I'll open it up for any Q&A if anyone has any questions or, or thoughts or comments. Yeah. Yes, how do you make data anonymous? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, so the key bit about anonymous data is that you can't have any system that you could roll back on, right? So to make data anonymous, you have to, it has to be truly anonymous, right? It has to be truly random in terms of your approach so that you can't roll back. So um, for an email address on user, for example, you know, xyz at, you know, 123.com or something, you know what I mean? It's, it's a field like that has to be filled in, so you have to keep that, uh, that in there. Nullification is also a good way to, to go anonymous as well. Just get rid of uh, some data points that you're not going to need in the future. So we talked about, let's say, if all you have is someone's age, 
Well, that's not personal data because you can't identify anyone just from their age. So uh, something like that is maybe something you keep, but then the, you, maybe you delete three or four data points that all of a sudden means, okay, I can't identify that person anymore. I get rid of their address and their name. Well, there you go. I'm no, there's no way I can identify that person anymore. So uh, there's, they're the two approaches really where you're sort of putting in random or you're nullifying certain data points so that the data set as a whole means you can't identify individuals. Yeah. just for the, the audience, so it's what, what obligation do you have when a, a, an employee asks you to delete um, their data and it's, it's an important part of your system? So it comes back to that lawful basis, right? So um, the right to be forgotten is not absolute, right? So it, it's not like that supersedes anything else. So in terms of, say, contractual necessity or legal obligation or anything like that, so employment law, for example, there's lots of reasons why you're going to have to keep that data because maybe bonuses were based on it or X, Y, and Z. So there's, there's a period of time you're going to have to keep that data for, and GDPR would not supersede any of that. So the right to be forgotten, it all comes back to lawful basis. Uh, and if ultimately, you know, I mean, it's, it's 20 years later, and the person says, you know what, actually, I hate the fact that you've got my data, um, and I don't think it's important to you anymore, there's no lawful basis then you'd start to get into maybe anonymization um, and where you can actually keep the data points but maybe anonymize who exactly um, went in that. So that's really just something to, um, it, it's, what I would say is that's an area where you definitely want to talk to a legal person but I would say um, it's not an absolute right is, is ultimately what it comes down to. Yeah, that's it. Like it's it's it, the application of the law is where the subtlety comes in, and the, the but you do have to be. So what I would say is, what well, what I'm hearing is, you do need to show that you're moving towards your your compliance. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to wait for two years. I'm going to do nothing in the meantime. You've got to sort of start moving towards it. You've got to start really um, changing. And and yeah, obviously, I mean, you'll adapt as you sort of um, start to understand those grey areas um, for uh, your and everyone else's business. Yeah. Spoke about anonymizing data and looking at the wall to see whether PII data might exist. Yeah. What about data existing documents and notes and uh, activities and activity history? Because potentially, if you're going through exactly. a discussion process, you could have strings of activities which you're then going to have to pile each one of those produces. Are there any tools or techniques out there for identifying information in those types of structures rather than specific fields? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, search across lots of different areas, right, is, is maybe one, one technique, and there, there are tools out there, right, that allow you to search, you know, multiple sources of data, and, and uh, I think Covio is probably one that just comes to the top of my head, but um, absolutely, and look, this is why doing that audit at the beginning and understanding where that data lives is really important, um, because like you say, it's not, it's not like it's immediately obvious to say contact record, but then, you know, there's lots of things behind that. So doing a careful analysis is really important. And absolutely, but I mean, look, if their name exists in the contract, maybe you have to keep that contract, right? So that, that doesn't um, come under that. So really it's, it's, yeah, doing your audit, understanding where it is, understanding what you're going to need. I mean, maybe you do need to buy something like Ovio because you have just happened to have people's names in a bunch of different places that you, you want to sort of be really confident of, of getting rid of all of them. So yeah, it's a great point. I mean, it's, there's no easy answer to that, unfortunately. Any other 
Yes, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, Salesforce themselves, right, have, have the, they have a GDPR trailhead. Uh, and they will continue to, to produce more information. There's actually a really, there's a, a I think they're called White and Case, it's a, it's a law firm, but they've got a, um, a whole explanation of what GDPR is. Very thorough, I would definitely recommend maybe going have a look. That's more about the legal part of GDPR, but it'll start to get your mind working about how maybe that's applied to Salesforce. I think it's White and Case is the name of that uh, law firm. They're... Um, they're like a you know a massive multinational law firm, but they've actually produced some very good stuff on their website. I think we may be, so maybe we can yeah. yeah. In your system, um, obviously that is a, it's a great question. You are probably going to have to have some data point to be able to say, look, I've I've executed on this. Whether you need to actually have personally identifiable information in that, maybe it's a timestamp of the request, and that's something that you can link back to the request coming in, maybe via call center or when that person says they made it. Um, but absolutely, I think the proof will come when if, if that person is then able to sort of prove, well, look, you've actually contacted me afterwards, so you didn't execute that. That's probably more what it's about. But tracking that process, because it won't be immediate, you're not going to forget someone like in 10 seconds, but maybe tracking the case, having the full sort of history there um, and time stamped and sort of um, in a way that maybe you can sort of track back on. It's a great question though. I, I don't really have an answer to the, the PII stuff. There's the, there's the UK global head of IAPD who helped contribute to the GDPR laws and I'm speaking in two downstairs. There is a guy to go and ask that very question. <laughs> Yeah, that's all we've got time for. Any more questions? I'm sure you can grab David. Sorry. Yeah, thank you.